Good afternoon, uh, everybody, and welcome to our final session this afternoon at the uh, Autism Theology and Church Conference. Uh, I'm Denise Maud, and I'll be moderating the uh, this afternoon's session entitled From Charity to Teacher to Profit to Simply a Member of the Body of Christ. Um, and we'll be hearing from Brian Brock and Joanna Leidenhag a little later. This session is going to finish slightly earlier uh, than advertised um, at about quarter past five uh, because Leon wants to just spend 15 minutes wrapping up um, the last uh, three days of, of the conference. So our Q&A will be slightly shorter than uh, the previous um, panel sessions. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, I'll introduce our speakers in a little bit more depth in a moment. Um, and I'm sure if you've attended some of the other sessions already, you will have heard these uh, housekeeping rules before. Um, but if you haven't, this is your first session, you're more than welcome here with us this afternoon. The sessions are uh, going to be recorded as you uh, heard just a moment ago, and the recordings will be made available um, after the conference, uh, they it will be a little while before uh, they are made available. It takes a while to get them uploaded. You will receive an email um, on the email account that you registered with the conference with um, to say when they will be um, live and ready to view. Some uh, just some other housekeeping. Um, we want this to be a safe space, uh, first and foremost. Uh, we've all come to this conference because we have um, an interest in autism theology and church. And whilst we have that in common, we are aware that we've come from different perspectives and different backgrounds. And we remember that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, as the psalmist reminds us. And as we hear the talks and reflect on the things that we're hearing and the questions that are raised, in some sense, we remember that we are uh, working on holy ground. So with that in mind, um, any questions that are asked, please, can they be asked in a respectful uh, manner? Any abusive comments and questions will be, will be removed and not accepted. We want this space to be a place of mutual learning from one another. And that requires us to be vulnerable with one another, to, sit, to be sensitive with one another's needs, um, but also at the same time, enabling each other to respectfully challenge what we've heard. Do take breaks as you need to. Um, the sessions are being recorded, as I said. Um, so this session will run in the following format. Um, we'll hear firstly from Brian um, for about 30 minutes, and then we'll take a five minute screen break um, and uh, an input break um, to process some of the things that we have heard. And then we'll have a response from Joanna uh, for 15 minutes. And then uh, we'll go into a Q&A and we aim to finish at 5.15. Um, it's I really realise it's going to be very unlikely that we will get through all of your questions, but we'll do um, we'll do our best um, to get through um, as many as we can. If you want to um, ask a question, uh, please use the Q and A function, which, if you're on um, a laptop, um, is at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're on a mobile device, I'm not sure where that is. I'm sorry, um, but on the on the laptop, that's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, feel free to make comments. Um, it would help our moderators behind the scenes uh, if you're going to make a comment to uh, start your comment with the word comment um, and also put uh, please share more widely or um, feedback just for um, panel um, so the moderators know whether they can share it um, with everyone in the chat. You can also uh, pose your questions anonymously by ticking the box that says um, anonymous. Um, however, I won't be sharing names um, on, on screen or on the recording. So if you forget, um, don't worry too much. So if I could ask our speakers to switch their cameras on so I can introduce them both. Super. So our first speaker is uh, 
Professor Brian Brock. Brian is a professor of moral and practical theology at the University of Aberdeen. He is also a husband and father of three children, including Adam, who is 13, a delightful human being, and has Down syndrome and autism. Brian has written a wide range of scholarly essays on themes related to disability and is a managing editor of the Journal of Religion and Disability. He has published two books that approaches theological questions through interviews, most recently one that extensively cross-examines the theology of the internationally famous American theologian and ethicist Stanley Harrowhouse. He has also edited with Professor John Swinton, Theology, Disability and the New Genetics, Why Science Needs the Church, and Disability in the Christian Tradition, a reader. In 2016, he founded the academic monograph series TNT Clark Enquiries in Theological Ethics, of which he remains a managing editor. In 2017, he was appointed to the Executive Committee of Archway, a multi-million pound annual budget charitable foundation that runs homes for special needs adults, as well as a respite service for children and families with special needs. Baylor University Press has recently released his first full-length monograph on the theology of disability, Wondrously Wounded, Theology, Disability and the Body of Christ. In it, he sets his own story with Adam within the historical sweep of Christian thinking about what it means to be human, drawing on the riches of traditional Christian theology to find life-giving ways forward in a modern technological West, routinely screens out lives like Adam's. Responding to Brian will be Joanna Leidenhag. Dr. Leidenhag is a lecturer in theology and liberal arts at the University of Leeds. Having completed her PhD in systematic theology at the University of Edinburgh, Joanna previously worked at the University of St Andrews on a science engaged theological project. She is interested in how the she is interested in how the psychological sciences can be used as a constructive resource for theological inquiry and is currently writing a book on autism and theology. So without further ado, I will hand over uh, to Brian for, uh, for his talk. Thanks so much, Denise. Um, it's, uh, I appreciate that kind introduction and it's an honor to finish a conference um, that I'm going to be, uh, the paper is uncannily similar to the paper that Grant McCaskill gave that began it. Um, and the first way in which it's similar is that I'm, I'm just gonna sort of present the paper and I don't have any visuals. So if you prefer to kind of lay down and listen or uh, uh, engage with it some other way, please feel free. When Christians confess their need for redemption, we're asserting not that we're willing to be changed, but that we're positively hungry for it, that we desire sanctification. Though it was not pre-planned, this is the kind of thematic symmetry between this final paper at the end of the conference and the paper that Grant McGaskill gave at the beginning, um, this theme of repentance. If there's one thing that we can say about disability and condition, conditions like autism, it's that they raise the question, who needs to change here? Honestly facing the discomforts caused by those who we experience as different is not simply an ethical challenge, but the fundamental spiritual challenge faced by the church today. Let me be clear from the outset that I'm speaking as, and in the first place, first instance, two neurotypical Christians who, who are rarely a minority in the audience as they might be in the context of this conference, and are typically therefore unaware of the ways in which churches and society at large constantly preach the message to autistic people that they must change in order to be accepted. So I wanna say on one side that uh, because redemption means sinners are incorporated into Christ's body, which is a social organization, every Christian is in principle gonna be reshaped by becoming uh, a Christian and becoming part of Christ's body. Uh, uh, so I don't wanna deny anyone the, um, the need for and the grace of transformation. And yet the, the type of transformations that our society asks for and in many cases enforces are, I wanna argue, different in kind from the transformations 
that uh, we undergo in the body of Christ. In our coming together before God in the space of worship, the relational fibers that bind us together may therefore become more visible as well as their absence or rival ways of binding us together socially. Some will notice the emphasis in my recent work as uh, uh, Dr. Leidenhug has uh, in approaching disability from the question of the gathered worship of, of, of the church as a social space and doxology as a uh, specifically configured form of human action. I begin this way and draw attention to this social space and activity of the praising human in order to suggest that those who explicitly admit that they're gathered by God and to be with God and draw, having been drawn together by God can perhaps for the first time see their resistance to change in its true light as resistance to God. Though the construction of self-protective routines and mental habits is a natural reflex of sinners of all stripes, it remains one out of which we need to be saved for the sake of those who suffer under the crushing inertia of neurotypical assumptions about how religion works. That's obviously been a theme all day today in the papers uh, and in fact, across the whole conference. That's the negative side of the equation, uh, the harm caused by neurotypical Christians resistance to change. But it's what this resistance misses, misses that I want to suggest is far more damning, that the church doesn't hear what the spirit of Jesus says to it through the members of his body that it thinks of as disabled. So I want to consider in this paper the, the, the chilling thought that it may be those from whom society expects the least that we're going to hear the specific and contextually relevant claim of Christ on our society that most needs to be heard uh, in, from the church in our society. I start there because I think from its very earliest generation, the church understood this point and Paul succinctly summarized it in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, this is verses 21 to 24. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those of members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members don't need this. As the apostle also made clear in this same chapter of Corinthians, those whose society looks down on are not only to be given greater honor, but like every other believer are to be attended to as conduits of the life-giving Holy Spirit promised to every single baptized Christian. As he says in verses four to seven of chapter 12, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good, right? So that, that is a egalitarian statement, and it's not precisely the same egalitarianism of modern liberal democratic societies. The, uh, the, the baseline point that I'd like to get across in this paper is what difference that might make. The way in which the early church defined uh, its stance toward the poorest of the poor, the class of beggars must certainly be understood as an attempt to take Paul's account of the subversive political unity of Christ's body with full seriousness. From the first Christian centuries, Christians considered the poor as emblematic of the church's very existence, a badge of honor to be carried up front. For example, when a group of beggars was ostentatiously part of the traveling entourage of the bishop, as was common in certain quarters of uh, the first Christian centuries. A testimony of this alertness is found in John Chrysostom's commentary on the verses I've just read from 1 Corinthians, in which he speaks of beggars, quote, as fixtures and splendid ornaments at the doors of the sanctuary, without which the church, quote, would not attain its full stature. The preacher is highly sensitive to Paul's agenda, even granting beggars their own embodied proclamation that appropriately seconds that of the preacher and surpasses the preacher's eloquent voice in clarity and urgency. Quoting again, while we preachers sit before you and recommend what will do you good, 
the one who sits before the doors of the church addresses you no less than we do by his mere appearance without saying a word. There's no doubt that Chrysostom considers the poor to offer a special gift and ministry to the church and that he grants those with no worldly power a voice of their own that the church needs to hear. The problem I'd suggest is that this description falls into the temptation to equate the spiritual gifts with social roles, vocation and natural talent. The sermon that Chrysostom understands Christian beggars to preach is effectively a warning to the established members of the church and society that runs something like, and this is a quote again, man's life is a shifting and precarious thing. Our condition is like a swift river that never wants to stand still, but always rushes downhill. The difficulty with this appeal is not its salutary assault on the certainty of those who suppose themselves normal and so secure, but the way that it depends on and so solidifies social stations as equivalent to spiritual gifts. The beggar is not understood by Chrysostom to offer one of the lists, lists of gifts that Paul has enumerated. He's instead calling the beggar's poor dressed and outstretched hand their gift to the community that in fact reifies the poverty of the poor as their spiritual gift. There's not a lot of beggars appearing in Western churches these days, which isn't to suggest that churches have abandoned charity work on, the behalf, on behalf of the poor. The poor have, however, long ceased to be thought of as a visible badge of honor that the churches wish to, wish to keep as fixtures and splendid ornaments at the door of the sanctuary. Label, labeling disabled people today the poor is only appropriate to the extent that this label draws attention to the social construction of inferiority superiority schemes. Every church would wish today to think of itself as having one or even two people with disabilities in their midst. And congregants are willing often to make some adjustments to make the worship space physically accessible, as well as putting up with some disturbances or what are seen as disturbances from these members of the body uh, they might, that they might cause in the hour of worship. But unfortunately, the logic of this type of inclusion expresses exactly the assumptions that we've seen in John Chrysostom. The focus remains precisely on the appearance of there being some visible diversity in the congregation which is to reduce the gifts that are expected from disabled people to the lack and difference they make visible. It's a baptizing of contemporary hierarchies of social value, and, it, and that's why it, uh, it fixes them. And if we follow that, the lead there, it'll only make those uh, uh, hierarchies of social value worse as we, like the early church, parade our special members as proof that we're an inclusive community. The real, and I'd suggest spiritually deadly problem, is a lack of expectation that the Spirit's gifts will be given to the community from each member. Nothing will be expected from those whose contribution has already been predetermined according to the hierarchies and weakness of weakness and strength that are all too obvious in our societies. And I mean that both in uh, uh, the deadening effects of thinking that someone who is educated and articulate must be. Uh, uh, the pastor slash leader and somebody who's the opposite of those things must be dependent and a recipient of support. Paul's asking Christians to look again at what it means to be a worshiping community. The gifts that those with disabilities reveal to the church may be manifold and are certainly not reducible to the message of their disability. The easy equation of gift with appearance deprives the church of the implicit matrix in Paul's discussion for a genuine embracing of the charismata, that is, surprise, wonder, and discovery about what sort of gift the spirit might be attempting to give through the life of any individual member of the body of Christ. Gifts, Paul is suggesting, need to be discovered in between the bearer and recipient. This in between is the particular theater of operations of the spirit who does not only originate the gifts, but needs actively to donate them right into the middle of interpersonal relational space. I'm the father, as, De uh, as Denise has already mentioned, of Adam, who's 18, uh, and on the autistic spectrum to the extent of being nonverbal, as well as being, as having Down syndrome. 
and I want to I draw attention to him because I want to illustrate the claims I'm making by offering a testimony to having been confronted in particularly intense ways by the gifts that I believe God has given through Adam. Adam certainly doesn't sit at the doors of the church preaching with his need and dependence. This doesn't mean that what he preaches is easy to hear or to read. Over a decade, for over a decade, we attended a large cathedral church here in Aberdeen, laid out in the traditional Western pattern uh, of a cross um, that has a long central uh, aisle and uh, kind of narrow crossbar side wings. Upon entering the church, one is faced with this long nave beyond that choir stalls and even beyond that, the communion stable. And most of the action uh, in the service takes place in the middle of the crossing, uh, which is, has on one side the pulpit and on another side the lectern. Uh, and it's in this central space where our priest Isaac Pubalon speaks and sings, stands and kneels for most of the first half of the service. For years, the Brock family occupied a pew near the front of the congregation, which began truthfully so that Adam could be close enough to the, to the action to uh, to engage it, but al also to be near an exit. In the course of his 13th year, Adam decided that he wanted to sit with Isaac in the crossing. It was a Pentecost Sunday when he left our pew to sit on the floor next to Isaac as Isaac stood and presided. Um, and from there, Adam proceeded to take off his shoes and socks uh, and stayed for the rest of the first half of the service, the liturgy of the word within arm's reach of the presiding minister. And that habit basically continued from that day forward. And as you can imagine, his lively presence disturbs a lot of common expectations about the behavior of young people in the church. Um, and this, in this, I'm uh, here overlapping with David Teo's um, paper earlier, uh, especially his story about the young boy um, sort of jumping onto the communion table. As his parents, my wife Stephanie and I, of course, the minute Adam got up, had to resist the urge to force him back to his seat with the congregation. Um, a, a type of wrestling that actually never really goes away. Deciding against doing that, however, meant that we had to think about how we could guide Adam toward occupying this highly visible space in the worship of the community in a, in a manner that made a contribution and didn't um, detract too, too visibly. That means we've had to negotiate a running inner war with our own expectations about appropriate children's behavior in church and um, our inner channeling of the gazes or imagined gazes of the congregants and choir members. But encouraged by his minister, and here I'm using the pronoun his intentionally, we've let Adam continue to pursue his expressing his membership in the body in his own way. So now Adam's being visually right next to the minister has changed the tone of church in ways that, of course, we could have, couldn't have anticipated. A choir used to performing has been forced to ask what it means to have Adam humming and stimming uh, you know, between them and the congregation. A church that sees itself as a, as a flagship of the diocese has had to ask what it means to have a teenager who walks into the center of church and takes off his shoes and socks and then uh, is, is there stimming. Um, for those of you who don't know what that means, he's kind of rocking back and forth and often swinging something repetitively in his hands and making a range of, of vocalizations. Um, and he's doing that literally at the feet of the presiding priest. Speaking for myself, one aspect of the Spirit's gift through Adam is to liberate the congregation from any pretension that we're a church devoted to presenting a culturally and aesthetically flawless performance, or that we're not a church for everyone. And I want to add one more point here, which has only become clearer to me as we've moved to another church during the last two years, um, a church with a very different liturgical setup. I believe that Adam's witness to this cathedral church that I've just described wasn't just generic. Um, and I think the point was nicely described in the panel discussion yesterday with Stephen 
Bedard, Claire Williams, and Mark Arnold. If Adam distracts people with his pattern of odd noises and stimming, for example, he's doing this all the time in all sorts of social contexts. And I've just come from a meeting at a school um, on something else. And because Adam's not in school, he had to go and he was doing that. And it was in a way disruptive. Um, so what I've presented the story I have about his rising up on Pentecost Sunday as a response to a specific calling by the spirit to a specific ministry desperately needed by this particular congregation. And I only began to consider this point now that we've been in another church for a while where he simply acts differently. To make my theological point explicit, the apostle Paul's life and witness were configured totally by his being called to preach to the Gentiles not his being a man or a Jew or a former Pharisee well-trained in them all. Those all the, though all those things were part of who he was. In the same way, I'm suggesting, Adam's witness to St. Andrew's Cathedral was not a matter of his having attended a special school or being a teenager or his being dependent on one-to-one -one accompaniment. The Spirit was calling Adam to challenge that congregation in very specific ways. And thanks be to God, Adam listened. I'm sure that some hearts were changed in significant ways as a result, and I, I've learned that from people firsthand. But whether the gifts of the spirit that Adam was offering to this particular congregation uh, were received or not wasn't up to him any more than it was up to Paul, whether his preaching of Christ and him crucified struck home in the hearts of those who heard him teach and preach. Those who saw Adam and Paul were free to the extent that sinners are ever really free to cling to their fixed ideas about who God is and so resist the introspection and repentance that leads to salvation. If this is a plausible example of how God's, quote, giving greater honor to the inferior member might look in our world, it also reveals how God's working and presence may be especially visible in the ways that disabled people live among the congregation. The gift given by the disabled person, the poor person, the recovering addict, all those of low esteem to the world emerges only through the spiritual discernment that's utterly certain that in the places where the eyes of fallen humanity expects nothing, there's a, charis a charisma from the Holy Spirit that upbuilds the community to be received. N none of this is meant to downplay people's legitimate needs for support and for special provision. But to treat everyone in church uh, as if taking their needs for support only as seriously as necessary without constraining our expectations of what the spirit might be bringing into the world and into the uh, congregation through them. The inability to grasp this point is the fundamental problem of the modern church. In treating some as continual recipients and never givers of gift, such a church enacts a forgetfulness that Christians are Gentiles grafted onto the true vine. Christians are the unsightly beggars being added to, to Israel. But thanks be to God, the church never escapes the spirit who teaches us that our gene genetic, physical, mental, national, and religious status is not all there is to us. Coming to the end here. One way to define the prophets of Israel is as those members of the worshiping congregation who wish to be changed by the spirit of God, no matter how painful the conflict confrontation this entails. Isaiah depicts the suffering servant as an object of hope precisely because he's not put off by Israel's unfaithful life and worship. He is the Messiah precisely because he mercilessly resists their sin, setting upon them unexpectedly, as the prophet indicates in the first two verses of Isaiah 65. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that didn't call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that's not good, following their own devices. The earliest Christians understood Jesus Christ as God's merciful confrontation of their desire not to be changed. And Jesus himself unambiguously preached that it was those who were low in the social pecking order who would be first to understand this. Jesus's merciful resistance to the sinful patterns of our world was to give those most despised by the powerful pride of place. Paul also says, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That's from earlier in 1 Corinthians. In the worshiping life of Jesus Christ's body, everyone is invited to learn to recognize the distinctive ways of this kingdom. The God who is the origin of the church's liturgy must continue to reveal his power as the power of those our society sees as powerless. Jesus Christ has promised to announce himself through the working of the spirit in that space, a, working, a work of breaking down our sinful human tendencies to transform Jesus Christ's form of strength into the strength, prowess, and possession of the liturgies of the powerful in this eon. Adam stimming, pirouetting, laying on the floor with his shoes off at the center of worship served the spirit's work of reminding a church, also often absorbed in its pictures of decorum and performance, that it was not made to shore up the rules that govern the institutional orders of the sage, uh, but follows a God who left the harmony of the spheres to enter the messiness of human life in order to transform it. As we're reminded this time of year, we worship a God who entered the human story in a barn in the backwater of the Roman Empire and embraced the full breadth of the human experience, even under submitting to a criminal's death outside of the city. We must continually relearn what we celebrate at Christmas, that God's power is most visible where it's least expected. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That was um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I was busy scribbling uh, pages um, of notes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm partly thinking, oh, great, I've got part of my Christmas sermon sorted there as well. Um, we're going to take um, a break for uh, five minutes um, just to allow uh, Brian's words to, to process in our own minds or to take a, a screen break and stretch our legs. So if we come back together um, at 4.38 um, and we can reconvene and uh, hear Joanna's response. Welcome back, uh, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, invite uh, Joanna to uh, pop on her camera and her microphone um, and hand over to her for her response. Great. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, so I want to thank the organisers of this conference uh, for the privilege to contribute to the conversation and um, to respond to Brian Brock's paper and really um, to continue a conversation that Brian and myself have already started um, in various publications and to bring it into this forum. And in particular, to respond to this paper um, on, in a sense on Christian hope, um, if not on the demand and the promise of God um, for transformation and for change. There is so much in Brian's paper that I could focus on um, or that I could comment on. Um, it's one of the richest papers I've heard in a long time. But I thought what would be particularly helpful for me as a reviewer to do is to provide some context um, for members of the audience um, who might be less aware of um, recent trends in disability theology. My goal here um, is not only somewhat pedagogical, but also because I think this is a good way of highlighting what Brian is really bringing to the field. Um, as I do this, I will raise um, two or three questions for Brian, um, each of which is an invitation really for him to say a bit more. Um, none of them are objections or critiques. But before I do this, I want to acknowledge that I think it's becoming clear that autism theology sits a little uncomfortably within the wider field of disability theology. Um, and when I talk about disabilities and disability theology in this response, I do not intend to reply that autism ought to be thought of as a disability in any other sense than 
as is put forward by the social model um, of this terminology as a kind of difference that is often misunderstood and marginalized. So I will speak of and implicitly speak of autism as a disability and as a topic for disability theology um, because it is out of this scholarly context that the autism about that the conversation about autism and theology emerges, not for any other reason. So the first piece of context I think it's helpful to bear in mind is that over the last decade, a number of disability theologians have expressed concern with what John Swinton calls mere inclusivity. That is the kind of inclusivity that whilst often well-intentioned and charitable, still protects the status quo and maintains the magnanimous power dynamics of the able-bodied host and the disabled guest. Whilst this mere inclusivity tries to reduce the effects of marginalization, it does not challenge the basic beliefs and value systems that created this inequality and injustice in the first place. Mere inclusivity calls for adjustments, not redemptive transformations. So instead, many disability theologians, and I'm thinking here of Francis Young, Hans Reinders, and Amos Young, amongst others at the University of Aberdeen, offer instead what we might call a prophetic model of disability. The prophetic model seems to me to be the theological equivalent of the social model of disability. For the prophetic model, um, the role of people who are labelled disabled is in communicating divine judgment against the ableist assumptions of liberal society and even against the ableist hopes of much Christian eschatology, that is hope for the afterlife or for the end of time. As I read him, Brian has some sympathy for this prophetic model. After all, um, it really does call for both personal and structural change. But in this paper and in his book, Wondrously Wounded, Brian uses Chris, uh, John Chrysotom's famous sermon as a foil in order to challenge the loose consensus in disability theology. He asks us to think again about disability in light of the full gospel of grace, in light of the good news, to see the diversity of bodies, not only in the context of God's no to injustice, but also as part of God's bigger yes to all of humanity. To think about annunciation and gift, as well as about judgment and justice. And this is for clear theological reasons. First, in Christianity, judgment must itself be understood as a work of the spirit and as a gift of grace. And second, this gift of judgment is never without other gifts, gifts of mercy, gifts of power to the weak, gifts of sanctification to the sinner. So my question to Brian is really what set of ideas is doing the heavy lifting and the constructive work here? So on the one hand, I have already given a number of theological reasons why we ought to follow Brian from inclusivity to prophecy, and then to seeing those that are labeled disabled as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. We might also add other theological reasons, such as a commitment to the charismatic priesthood of all believers. But I'm aware that one can also match these theological approaches to disability alongside sociological model, models. So mere inclusivity seems to go hand in hand with the charity model of disability. The prophetic model in theology, as I've already said, runs side by side with the social model. 
And finally, I think we might interpret the gift giving model, if I can call it that, of what Brian has offered us today as going hand in hand with the idea of neurodiversity. So I want to ask Brian first, does he think that neurodiversity corresponds to how his gift giving approach to disability works? And if it does correspond, is it the theology or the sociology that's really doing the constructive work behind the scenes here? So now to my second point of context. In previous generations, one urgent practical question to be asked in disability theology was seen to be, can and should we baptize? Now, different denominations have different ideas about the necessary preconditions of baptism. But for all traditions, the question of the current or potential future state of salvation is one that is in focus. Now, happily, as far as I'm aware, all major Christian denominations will now, now baptize people of various diversities and disabilities. On a denominational level, this is no longer really in question, although frequently individual ministers may have to be sternly reminded of this. What Brian asks us to do is to take another step to say that given that baptism is the great equalizer before God, how do we see, hear, and receive the gifts that God is giving to his church through the, through the body, through each and individual believer? And this corresponds to what we might also see as a shift in doctrinal loci or kind of thematic teaching in theology. Disability theology has for a long time focused around the doctrine of humanity, questions about the image of God, as well as questions about Jesus Christ and salvation. But Brian points out that there are other important questions we need to consider, questions about the work of the Holy Spirit, questions about the shape and nature of the church. Rather than asking, how do we think about disability and salvation? We are instead invited to ask, how do we think about disability and vocation? And so this sets me up for my second question. Brian said that one of the problems with Chris Sotom's description of the beggars outside the church door is, and I quote Brian, that this description falls to the temptation to equate gift and role, vocation and natural talent, end quote. And I wonder if Brian would like to say a word more about what he sees as the danger here. I would have thought that one of the problems of Chrysotum is to the contrary, that he denies any link between vocation and natural talent because he defines the poor by their status and sees them as a homogenous group and does not see their individual abilities, personalities, natural talents. So really this is an invitation to not only say more about how the gifts that Brian has received through Adam intersect with Adam's particular embodiment, but also to say a bit more about his theology of gifts more broadly and how they relate to natural talents and roles, like um, priest, teacher, church warden, musician, member of the prayer ministry team, whatever role we have in mind. And to aid with this question, I would like to finish my response um, by complimenting Brian's absolutely wonderful story about Adam with a story of my own. And I do this because like Brian, I find I am overflowing with familial pride and I wish to celebrate in wonder. So when I thought about the gifts that the spirit has given to the church through my brother, Philip, who is autistic and has other learning impairments, I immediately thought of his formal role on the welcoming team, a role he takes absolute delight in and that places him importantly on the other side of Chrysostom's door. So Philip is one of the most outgoing people I've ever met. He loves going up to strangers and asking their names, their dates of birth, 
their marital status, their car registration number plate, and similar such information. His range of conversation, in fact, rarely extend beyond these facts. But his talent is that he doesn't like to forget these facts once he's learned them. As a gift to the church, this means that every person who enters church on a Sunday where Philip is welcoming feels known and remembered. Once he learns your birthday, your wedding anniversary day, or any date of a significant bereavement, he will phone you up and remind you of it. This puts him at wanting to make approximately 30 phone calls a day. As, as a family, we've lost count of the times people have told us how moved they were to receive these phone calls, that no one else remembered their birthday, that they were about to forget their own wedding anniversary, or that others were too polite to speak of the dead, and so they were suffering the anniversary of a bereavement in loneliness. Few people have even told me that Philip's phone calls brought them back to church after falling away from Christianity and not attending for many years. So Philip's strange gift of welcome, of comfort, and of evangelism even, arises directly out of his gregarious personality, his lack of adherence to social norms, and his formidable memory for his area of special interest. Put more simply, Philip's gift to the church, which has been formally recognized in a role as a member of the welcome team, is not in spite of his autism, nor do I think it could possibly exist apart from his autism, but is very much because of his autism, as well as, as, well as because of his other natural talents and his particular personality. So what can we learn here about how gifts, natural abilities, and roles relate. I want to thank Brian for his work and for this and the, for which this paper is just the tip of an iceberg. I look forward to continuing this conversation in the Q&A and hopefully for many years to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanna, for, um, for, your, for your response. Um, and as uh, Brian gathers uh, his thoughts on on his, on your response, um, I just invite people to continue to put questions into uh, the the Q and A box, um, which we will get to. Um, but first, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Brian to respond uh, to uh, Joanna's response. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Uh, um explosively interesting. Um, so uh, since this is being recorded, I will make bold to kind of rattle off a range of answers. Um, and if people want to follow up, they can kind of check the transcript or read them. Um, uh, Joanna gets a bunch of things that I've done in Wondrously Wounded in ways very few readers do. So I, I'm, I'm very grateful for her um, representation of various moves like for instance, of course, I'm using Chrysostom's sermon as a foil. Um, there's a there's a consensus that's emerged in uh, the, the the recently past generation of um, theologians thinking about disability primarily, not really about autism, in which they say that the message of disability for all of us is basically that we're dependent rational animals. That's become a conventional way to talk. It comes from Alistair McIntyre. The background is not really that interesting, but the point is that Chrysostom is just my way of attacking that position um, uh, and say, you know, I don't hold it against people who came up with that idea. It's a very long-standing idea, but um, I think it's wrong. And that takes me to my second point. Um, uh, at one level, it's wrong because it's just a Christianization of a philosophical idea, right? Like it, dependence and the human dependence on the care of others is something that can be understood by anyone. And it doesn't take Christian theology to understand that in any sense. And Christian theology doesn't even add anything to that. Um, I came to that sort of insight through uh, a, a kind of theological project working on First Corinthians, really. Um, uh, so, I, so I didn't, to, in answer to the first question, um, you know, is what I'm presenting the gift giving idea 
uh, of, of neurodiversity sociologically overdetermined. And I would say to that, uh, determinedly not. Um, I would say good theology always takes up the insights, all the sort of really powerful insights of all other discourses, but must not be configured by or steered by them. So uh, both genetically in terms of my own insights and theoretically in terms of what I'm trying to say, I really am trying to understand what's going on in 1 Corinthians 12. And I do think that it's long been recognized as a pivotal passage because uh, you know the, the sections that I read about the, the least honored and the least presentable members, uh, people have recognized that as a, somehow connecting to uh, conditions like what we refer to as disability today. Um, so I, I think that Paul really was genuinely trying to think about the theological issues that concern us today. And um, so I didn't, I, I actually, for the reason I'm about to explain in my answer to the second question, don't think neurodiversity is, is a gift in itself. It's just a, it's just a created reality. So this takes me on to the second point. And I, I think that Joanna's grasping what I'm trying to do in terms of once we affirm all baptized Christians are equal, then we need to ask further questions that shifts the, the baseline doctrinal questions that we bring to disability theology away from anthropology um, and toward uh, uh, salvi uh, sort of eschatology, um, ecclesiology, uh, so and pneumatology. Um, so that it, at one level, I'm trying to expand the doctrinal apparatus that we can bring to bear when we ask questions about disability. Um, uh, and I do so out of the interest to um, really genuinely break the, the link between um, what let's call natural talent. I prefer to call it creational gifts. Um, so when Joanna says, Chrysostom is denying any link between vocation and natural talent by saying that the poor have one message from God as, as a group. I agree that he is breaking that language, but I don't think he's tying it back together. And I think the, the theological um, problem I, I would maintain all the way down uh, is that Paul is trying to help us see um, that we are all endowed with certain capacities um, in a, in, in, on a range of levels and that, that those are just not the determinative level at which spiritual gifts are happening. So um, I, that's why you sort of creational versus um, the gifts of the spirit because the gifts of the spirit are never reducible to the person who's the smartest or the person who's, you know, is the least smart or the person who uh, can do some tasks that our society values or society that uh, who can't do those tasks. So I, I think Chrysostom reduces the gift to uh, a social role, but we could say the same thing from Paul's perspective, um, reducing the gifts to creation, created capacity is uh, in both registers, both at the sort of physical uh, level and at the social level, um, the gifts of the spirit are always acts which originate through in the spirit, come through individuals and every individual and build up the body of Christ. And they're, they're never related directly to uh, uh, the creational capacities. And we can see this very obviously in people who are highly talented in a, in a kind of worldly sense, in a creational sense, and who are never building anyone else up, right? So that Paul gives us a way to say that when we're talking about the gifts of the spirit, we tend in the Western church to have a pretty um, uh, uh, flat and inaccurate account of what the New Testament is pointing us toward. Um, and because we do, our politics suffer. Right, that's that's my, that's my basic point that we have a politics that is grounded in who can do stuff and who can't do stuff 
uh, or who has the capacity to do stuff and who doesn't. And that means we can't even see that sometimes people who don't have capacity to do amazing things, like the fantastic story that Joanna has told. Um, uh, uh, but it's not because they have that capacity that they that they do those things. And I think that's what Paul's trying to point us to because he was trying to build a community amongst heterogeneous social grouping and trying to tell them, it doesn't matter if you're the rich person or the poor person. What I wanna see is a community in which every interaction actually makes um, all of us more of more Christ-like, you know, in 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 our own language. So, um, Joanne is enough of a theologian to see that I'm. These moves are are sort of motivated to describe a different politic, and that they're. I'm moving the discussion laterally from the common play, doctrinal places to do the work to to some other doctrinal bases, and um, the reason I. I'm really appreciative of her paper and the, the chance to have this discussion is that the disability discourse is in many respects not a not a theologically mature discourse. Um, it, it's there's a there's a very narrow range of doctrinal material which tends to do almost all the analytical work, and um, that means that all kinds of questions can't be opened up. And very often, if you try to make a point, it sort of collapses into another point that you were trying to make. And I'll, I'll sort of close by saying one example of that is um, when I've made some of these arguments, even with senior scholars, and I'm thinking about discussion I had with Francis Young, um, it's very easy for uh, uh, what I'm trying to say to collapse back into the theodicy question. Well, did God really make people disabled? Um, and uh, what I'm trying to say is, in answer to your, I think your deep question, Joanna, um, uh, once we see um, someone fulfilling their role in God's story with the world in the community of worship, then we, under, we learn what their skills are for. And we don't start by seeing what their skills are and say, what can they can't do? Where are we gonna fit them in the community? It runs the other way around. In other words, um, uh, I, I doubt that I would have seen Adam stimming as his way of communicating the gifts of the spirit to the church if I hadn't seen him in the worshiping community as understood as a theologian and as an act of um, uh, spiritual challenge to remaking in that community. Um, uh, and I think, I can imagine a world in which Philip would have never had a church that in which his getting to know people could be um, understood as a, a kind of a, a, an act of spiritual care. Um, and that the, the idea that just because he can remember things means that's a spiritual gift, I think is um, short shifting his actual contribution. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Brian. Um, did you have anything in response to that, Joanne? Are you happy for me to go to some Q&A? Um, we, we've got um, some, some Q&A in the Q&A box. Um, there's one that came up that um, that disappeared, and I, and I do want to ask it just purely for my own um, my own curiosity, because um, it was a really great question. So um, I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to ask it, and the question was how um, Brian and and I suppose Joanna as well. You can chip in on this. Um, you mentioned one Corinthians twelve. How and and in relation to to Adam, um, how do you see that sitting um, with what we read later on in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 14, regarding orderly worship? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's actually pretty simple that I think there are times when, for instance, Adam would, there'd be a visiting pastor and Adam would be in his chair and he would pull off the glasses of that minister um, and he would get brought back to his seat. Um, I mean, I basically see it, it, this is very kind of simple, real life answer, but um, I think my 
Uh, I, I'm glad that as a teenager, as every teenager does in church, he went to the front and not to the back or out. So for me, point one, that's a win. Point two is I have a catechetical, cate, catechetical responsibility toward him as a member of the church. And um, I don't discharge that by teaching him Bible stories, but I do discharge that by helping him to understand his role in the liturgy of the church. And um, I didn't uh, create that desire in him to be, to play that role, but I do have a responsibility to help him understand some of its effects that he may not see. And I see that as totally contiguous with my responsibility to, to supervise you know, highly articulate doctoral students. Yeah, I would just add um, from 1 Corinthians 14, um, 26, everything must be done so the church may be built up, which is what Brian already said. Um, and just as it's a task of spiritual discernment to see the gift in the first place, it's a task of spiritual discernment to see when when the gift is building up the church and when it's not. Um, so, yeah, I can think of examples when Philip's nosiness is not building up the church um, as well as as well as when it is. So um, and, th and I think that's going to be true for each of us. I um, like to preach sometimes but sometimes that can lead to all sorts of lecturing when it's inappropriate as opposed to when I'm given the task does that make sense so I feel like that's true for everybody that's just a little example of from my life um it's not anything unique to Philip or Adam that we have to make those sorts of judgments um yeah it's true for everyone but I mean I would just say that the the insight that I think Joanna and I are agreeing on and trying to find ways to articulate is um, if church is an order that you have to slot people into, like the, the kind of you, if you go to church in Britain, you know, the road of culture, right? Like somebody has got to do it and it's got to be done right. And if you can't do it, we'll get somebody else. That's the opposite of what we're trying to talk about. And I think disability, autism, you know, whatever, name we want to talk about these kind of awkward fits with that world is a, is a real gift it's a gift of the spirit and if we receive it that's what i meant when i said if we can receive that if we can become a community that actually welcomes that and understands it for what it is as the way the body of christ works then we have something to offer to a world that is road is all the way down that leads us leads us ni quite nicely actually into um uh, the question which was posed at uh, 1633 for those behind the scenes who are going to uh, transfer them across into the chat. Um, what implications, um, I think it's for Brian and Joanna, you can, um, you'd be able to relate to this as well. What implications do you think Adam's behaviour might have for our modern understanding of prophecy? If there is a call upon us to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, are there ways in which we can better disseminate voices like Adam's and Philip's uh, within the body of Christ? I mentioned David Teo, and I, I, I've heard the story he told in a different version a couple of years ago, and that really struck me very strongly. Um, I mean, I think almost by definition, if you're around nonverbal people, and I recognize one of the rifts or the kind of fault lines that's opened up in the discussion here is um, there's a, such a wide range when we're talking about autism. Um, and I am uh, in many ways, especially interested in the, um, the kind of nonverbal end of that discussion. But if you're around nonverbal people or people whose modes of communication are to our experience non-standard, it's almost like you're being stuck in kind of prophetic situations all the time right like when uh, when someone's in church as david's story uh sort of recounted and they feel uncomfortable because the the communion table is not the way it should be and they go up and they lay their body on it that's like a classic old testament prophetic performance now 
you can say, oh, you can explain it away, just like you can explain away stories that I tell, uh, I've told in other contexts, right? But it, it, if you're a Christian, it seems to me it's a kind of dangerous thing to keep saying, oh, well, they do that because they don't understand. Um, so I'm, I, I certainly wouldn't sort of say disability equals prophetic vocation, but I would definitely say if you're around people who don't play by the rules, um, there's, a, there's a kind of constant hermeneutical challenge running there, which if we think God is afoot in the way we relate to one another, it's hard to resist thinking that there's a kind of known or unknown type of uh, kind of prophetic challenge going on in certain lives and that it's one that we do well to, to not only listen to, but become a community that can attend to. Yeah, the one thing that I'd want to add to that is, so I attend more charismatic churches than Brian's Cathedral Church. Um, and so I was really struck by how our conversation in this session and, and Brian's larger work draws us to the last few chapters of 1 Corinthians, or to the book of 1 Corinthians as a whole, but in particular chapters um, 12 through 15. Um, where there's a lot of stuff Paul says about the gift of tongues um, and, and how in the denominations and the churches that I attend that there's a very specific understanding about what the gift of tongues is and what it sounds like. Um, and this is really an insight that Amos Young has had for a long time, but expanding that to consider, to consider prophetic languages in a, in a wider sense. Um, to consider non-prophetic languages in all sorts of non-standard forms of speech, um, as Brian calls it, as Brian just said. Um, I think that could be a really helpful. I know there's been some work there, but still a helpful, um, a helpful place to rethink some of this stuff and to give it further reflection. And I can't resist just adding one footnote to that, that I, what I'm interested in as a church that uh, lives in power and truth and that if if you're in a community where there are dis disabled people and the community kind of uh, understands that it shows and my experience is that um, that is powerful to all who enter and that's ex also something Paul talks about like if if you're a community that has a bunch of prophesying and speaking in tongues and people come in and they can't understand it They'll, they'll say you're crazy and that discredits the gospel. But if they come in and there's this weird chaos that they can't understand, um, that can also be exactly the power of the gospel uh, on display. Uh, and, and so there's it's kind of chaos and there's chaos and it's part of understanding how the gospel works to be able to spot the difference between those. And I think that's really what First Corinthians is all about. Thank you, both um, Brian and Joanna. Um, I'm gutted that we can't go down any more questions. And I fear that if I ask you another one, I'm going to be really told off by, um, <laughs> by Leon for running over. Um, it, it has been um, a really rich um, discussion and, um, and I know that you, you've definitely given us um, lots to think about. There's various comments that are now popping up in the Q&A that people are happy to share so um, please do keep eye on, on, eye on, on the chat because um, those will be um, coming up for everybody um, to see soon. Uh, it just leaves me uh, to say thank you uh, to both Brian and Joanna um, for your presentations and your Q and your responses to the Q&A. Um, thank you once again to our uh, BSL interpreters um, for the work that they've done um, and also to all those who are working very hard behind uh, the scenes to keep the technology going. Um, that's it for me and I'm going to hand over to uh, Leon who's going to close um, our conference. Thank you very much Denise and thank you very much Joanna and Brian for a wonderful session and um, I agree with Denise that it would be wonderful to hear more from you. Um, I really recommend um, that people buy your books and, and read your articles because they are really great. 
So we've come to the end of our conference and um, the aims of this conference, as you might remember from the introduction on Monday, was to identify what was happening in the field and, um, and where the field is heading. In other words, this has been a, a scoping conference. And secondly, we wanted to identify and establish critical frameworks for emerging, the emerging conversation on autism and theology. In these final 10 to 15 minutes, I would like to highlight a couple of things that have come up. Uh, I thought that, that would be helpful maybe to, um, to wrap up the conference. Let me just uh, start by quoting a paragraph that was sent to all the speakers uh, for this conference. So we, um, we wrote in, the, in our invitation, given the growth in academic publications and more practical or training resources for faith communities, the Center for Autism and Theology wishes to identify the status quo, strategic issues, emerging trends, topics, questions, methodologies in the field of autism and theology. And therefore we organize this conference. So let me just start by the first, with the first line then. Given the growth in academ academic publications and more practical or training resources for faith communities, the fact that we have had five authors whose book were, books were just published literally in the past couple of months, and, and one is forthcoming, the one by Claire Williams, um, and then uh, we can think of Brian's book, Wondrously Wounded, in 2019, um, and Grant McCaskill's book, Autism and the Church, 2019. There are some other books coming up, I know. It just means that there is this, this is an emerging field, and it's and, and I felt during the these days at the conference that this is really uh, there's a buzz, there's there's it, there's something very much alive here. So I really hope that this is um, this conference contributes in a small way to developing that discussion. Then the second line, the Center for Autism and Theology wishes to identify the status quo, strategic issues, emerging trends, topics, questions, methodologies in the field of autism and theology. So what has come to the fore? A couple of things, I think, during the last couple of days and today. So in terms of methodology, I think one discussion more than any other discussion has to doubt, um, and that is the question of who's doing this research. Who has the right to speak, so to say? Do you need to be autistic to present at a conference like this? Um, do you need to be autistic to write about autism, do that research? Um, I think the discussions in this conference have indicated that that does not need to be the case. Stuart Repley, I think, help, quite helpfully uh, used that image of a pendulum. It's, it's swung just, just to one side at the moment. So how do you do that? Like this? And there is a danger of pushing it so far the other side that we end up with another imbalance. And hopefully we will end somewhere in the middle, as it were. Um, but nevertheless, it is an important question. And um, in, my, uh, in my response to Sue Fletcher Watson yesterday, I've tried to, to give some frameworks how we can theologically think about those kind of discussions. And I think Brian and Joanna actually have, a wonderful, have done, done a wonderful job of, of taking us two steps further, at least in that conversation. So um, that's, that's one of the issues. And then the second issue that has come to the fore in these days, I think, from the very first session onwards is the use of language. It was the topic of the first session, but has run like a scarlet thread throughout the, the conference. This is a methodological issue, but it is also a, an issue of content. Methodology and content are never separated. A language that we use is not neutral, but it constructs certain realities. It is necessary, therefore, to think about the language we use when discussing autism and theology. And of course, the question that we also need to raise, what does theology, God's talk, have to contribute to the discussion? Then a related issue uh, to languages is whether we can speak about disability. And again, this has come up in the, in the final talk. It has come up a couple of times. And one thing has become very clear. There is no straightforward forward parallel between autism and disability. And um, I think autism theology can learn a lot from the concepts frameworks in disability theology, but we need to be careful as Claire Williams, for example, warned us, not to confine autism theology to that discourse of disability theology. 
And I think that is something to keep in mind. And I should note at this point, um, between the sessions, you will have seen a slide. Uh, thanks for joining the conference. And then um, if you're interested, uh, check out our new uh, program in disability and theology. And I'm not saying that to make another plug for the program, although I'm quite tempted to do that. I just want to iterate and uh, ju just to emphasize here that that was not meant to make that connection between autism and disability. But it is to say that um, in that program, we will we, we do discuss a lot of the questions and a lot of the issues that have come up uh, during this conference. And I can't, has, uh, can't resist saying that you will actually study with some of the great speakers of this conference in that program. Um, another theme that has come up is uh, the, the, the very practical question about how can we be church? In, that is an important question, but we've also seen that that needs to, to go beyond question, the question of inclusion and accommodation and adjustments, but it needs to be a discussion about being the body of Christ together. Um, I think Kirsten Oliver has done a great job in leading a digital conference. I, I think that was amazing the way she did that. David Teo um, told his story, Brian and, and Joanna again have pointed to that as well. And then a related theme that has come up is the question about autism and clergy. On the one hand, there was the, the question about how um, clergy can be trained to become more aware of autism and how to, um, how to relate to autistic people in church. But also, what about being on the spectrum and being a clergy yourself? What kind of training needs do you have? But also the, 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 the issue about the selection processes that are simply not adjusted to people who fall outside the neurotypical norm, so to speak. So that's another area uh, that we need to think about. And in this session this morning, for example, um, well, not for example, this morning in the UK, uh, that is opened up the question about who we think God is. And that includes also questions around uh, how safe do we feel or anxious towards God? How guilty do we feel? Those kind of questions. And I think, interestingly, this may be quite different according to various traditions, church traditions and denominations in which you have been, um, which you have been part of. And maybe there is also cultural differences there. So the second part of the paragraph that we sent to, uh, with our invitation to the uh, speakers read as follows. By bringing together academics from various disciplines, as well as and practitioners and other interested parties, we also hope to strengthen existing and create new international and interdisciplinary uh, relationships. Furthermore, we hope to explore possibilities for network applications and grant applications. We have deliberately tried to invite a mix of academics, uh, interdisciplinary uh, academics and, and people working in the, in the third sec sector. And this is indeed another methodological point. Autism theology as an emerging discipline cannot be an ivory tower discipline. Central in the discussion needs to be the voices of autistic people themselves, both autistic academics, but also people in churches and society. This is an academic conference, and the Center for Autism and Theology is a theological academic research center. However, we cannot do our work, I believe, without input from the field, as it were. And an important aim for us is to serve church and society. So we do hope that this conference has strengthened existing uh, relationships, and I'm really grateful for the new relationships that have been uh, developed as or are developing as a result of this conference, international and interdisciplinary. We hope also that this uh, will help us to explore the possibilities for creating further research networks and hopefully also funding for future research because nothing comes for free. At the same time, we also need to be critical of ourselves. Whose voices have we not heard during this conference? Was this another predominantly white conference? What other contributions? Uh, what about the contribution of uh, contributions of autistic people who have, who do not use spoken language as their first language? And the attendees and the speakers have they come primarily from the global north? 
who are we reaching with these conversations? Who's taking part? I think those are some critical questions that we need to ask. And that brings me to next steps. We want to invite those who are interested in being part of Networks Research Consortia to get in touch um, with the center. And also anyone who is interested in continuing the conversation around autism and theology, autism and the church, autism and faith, please let us know. We will send up a follow-up form in the next few days. And I call it a follow-up form because it's not just an evaluation form, although it will include some questions to hear from you what you thought about uh, the conference, but also uh, you can indicate on the form what kind of conversations you would be interested in, in following up. Another next step is that over the past, uh, over the next couple of weeks and months, um, we will have some debriefing uh, conversations with people and then that will lead to a conference report and we will inform you when that is ready. And we don't know yet what kind of shape or form that will take. It might be a conference report, a PDF on the website. It might be a journal article, we will see. And then meanwhile, the conference, uh, the, the center uh, will continue to organize uh, webinars four times a year and we have some other activities. If you want to keep up to date, then uh, email cat at abdn.ac.uk. I'm coming to close. But before we close, I really want to express my deep gratitude to all the speakers, all the respondents, all the panelists. Each one of you have given us so much, so rich input. Um, and that, that, that really makes this conference a success. Thank you very much for that. We also want to say thanks to our wonderful moderators, John Swinton, Hannah Kandel, Lindsay Downs, Joanna Leidenhardt, and Denise Mott. Thank you so much. You've done a wonderful job, I think. Thank you to our wonderful BSL interpreters. I see Craig on the screen, but there was Margaret and Rachel and Alice behind the scenes. And thank you so much for making this conference much more accessible. Thank you. And then thank you to the advisory group of the Center for Autism and Theology. Um, they have given us uh, invaluable input and feedback during the course of organizing this conference. So thank you very much for all the wonderful work that you do for the Center. It's really much appreciated. And then all the attendees, thank you so much for all your rich questions, your thoughtful questions um, that has made this conference what it is. But finally, last but not least, to more than anyone else, I want to express my deep, deep gratitude to Sarah, Manon, and Rachel Denley. Maybe you can switch on cameras just for a moment so that the people can see who the wonderful people are behind this conference. You've made, you've gone just, just way beyond what I could have or anyone could have reasonably expected from you. Thank you so much. You've just gone over and beyond, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful to you. Um, You've, without you, this conference simply wouldn't be what it was. So I don't, I don't think that we have um, an opportunity for a digital hand clap, but can I just invite everyone where they are just to give a warm round of applause to Sarah and Rachel. Thank you so much. And thank you, Leon. And with that, we've come to the close um, of this conference. Thank you all very much, keep in touch.